My name is Manon Adas. I was initiated in 1974 by Shila Prabhupada, and I was asked to say something about my spiritual master, my personal experience, if any, there were some. So I accepted, and I'm going to say something. I think we are six people we are supposed to speak today. In the list, there were six people. So if we have an hour and a half, so that means about 20 minutes each. So it's not much, but you know, more or less 20 minutes. Every time I get to speak about Srila Prabhupada, or personal uh, remembrances of Srila Prabhupada, I ask myself two questions. First question, how much the pronoun I should be present? Should be kept a minimum, and that minimum should be only for contextualize the story I am saying, I'm, I'm telling. Second, how much I am morally um, expected to say something very intimate, personal realization, personal emotions, things like that. That should be even less than minimum because it's personal, it's private. Some may believe what they say and these people will try to imi imitate, uh, risking to become Prakrita Sahaja, something like that, more or less. Second, will not believe me and I think that I am faking something that there was not. So in both cases, I just don't like it, and uh, I will just omit uh, most of personal realization. This effect that uh, being in presence of Srila Prabhupada was something extraordinary, and I'm sure all my god, god sisters and god brothers had some kind of uh, emotions, spiritual emotions, maybe 80% spiritual, 20% material, maybe vice versa. Whatever it is, we all have some kind of emotions because Srila Prabhupada was not a normal man, not even a normal guru, or something really uh, extraordinary. So, His Divine Grace had only one desire, to spread Krishna consciousness. So we all know that. And, uh, uh, but in my native country, the Mahamantare Krishna arrived before him. Arrived in 1972, when the radio was broadcasting the Radha Krishna Temple um, album. And uh, I liked especially the Hare Krishna Mantra. And seated in the Padmasana, I was practicing some yoga with my guitar. I was chanting Hare Krishna. 1973, the movement arrives in my country, which is Italy. And um, Srila Prabhupada asked the very known devotees here, devotee here in Vrindavan <coughs> to come to Italy and open a temple. And this devotee accepted. He didn't speak a single word of Italian, so he went through Paris, he picked up some Italian-speaking devotee, and he came. At the end of 73, December, our first temple was rented, and the Hare Krishna movement came in Italy. At that time, there were 60 million people living in the country, speaking the language. So, in those 70, 60 million people, there were a number of people patiently waiting for Krishna Conscious to arrive, some other impatiently waiting for Krishna Conscious and arriving, trying to figure out what this is all about, why I'm alive, what I'm doing, what is going to be my life, you know, what, what sense does it make everything. I don't want to study, I don't want to work, I don't want to. Many, many people, they were, we were very idealistic at that time. 
we were coming out from the 60s and um, so everything was ideal. The ideal of spirit, the ideal of an absolute truth. And uh, so uh, in February, the uh, Gornita Editi was established in Italy. Very beautiful ditty, they are still there. Exceptionally beautiful. And, uh, and Sila Prabhupada accepted to come to Italy in May, at the end of May 1974. There were very few devotees, but very enthusiastic, very pure in their heart. At that time, I would say that we had a lot of pure devotees. You know, we, living in a temple wasn't easy, it was very austere. We were getting up at 2.30, 3 o'clock, cold shower, very cold shower, and uh, Mongol Arctic, the Brahmachari Ashram, they were all the Brahmachari, were closed by key. You could not go back to sleep because it was closed. So someone would go to sleep on the top of the, the building and someone in the car, someone, anyway, all of us were trying to sneak around and find some place to sleep. Summertime was easy, wintertime was not so easy. So the devotees, they were in total ecstasy, Srila Prabhupada is coming. And uh, this phrase, Srila Prabhupada is coming in, in the 70s, were like a magical phrase, Srila Prabhupada is coming. And everyone became, used to become exceedingly happy and dynamic. Let's prepare uh, this country, Rome, the capital city, for Srila Prabhupada's arrival. So they literally papered the whole city. In Rome there were about five million inhabitants at that time. Five million, so a lot of people. So they uh, papered the whole of the, of the, uh, the, uh, the city with Srila Prabhupada posters, black and white posters. I never forget that. Just the face, that's the first. You could see only his face and written Sila uh, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. That was my first encounter with Sila Prabhupada, it was not physical. It was uh, looking at his face. First time, uh, big traffic, 10, 15, 20 minutes in the bus, everyone like this looking outside, you couldn't move. So we were just a unique ball of flesh inside the bus. And the bus stopped in a traffic light. In the traffic light, there was a Srila Prabhupada poster. And there was just in front of me. And I was looking to him for 15, 20 minutes. And uh, I tell you, this is what's called a mystical experience, which I'm not going, as promised, I'm not going to tell anything about. But it was very deep, um, extraordinary uh, inner experience of seeing the messenger of God coming to my city. And I was seeing the devotees around. I didn't like the Hare Krishna, although I figured out that the Hare Krishna month and the Hare Krishna, they had something to do. But uh, uh, I didn't like them very much, the way they were very young and they had the green dotties, uh, blue, uh, blue t shirt they were not kurtas at that time, like this. But I like very much the sage. I didn't know that he was the spiritual master of the Hare Krishna. So, and uh, everywhere I went, there was a Srila Prabhupada face, everywhere. And the devotees told me, for some reason I couldn't go to his conference, and I didn't know that they opened the temple just to end at 200 meters from my home. I mean, Rome is a huge city. You could take three or four hours to go from one side to the other side. But uh, the devotees, they were, um, I don't know how, what to say about this Krishna's kindness. They opened the temple so close to my home. So, first time, uh, so Srila Prabhupada came, Srila Prabhupada went. A couple of months passed, I went to the temple. And there I saw Srila Prabhupada seated, picture of Srila Prabhupada seated in the temple room. Then at the day I decided that they are Krishna, they were already, okay because the Hare Krishnas were the disciples of my spiritual master. What I decided it was 
my spiritual master said, though I had never seen him, it was just a mystical experience, a mystical decision. At the time I was 18, so very young. <coughs> so I joined in August, took initiation in November. At the time it was pretty quick, taken initiation. And, uh, but I didn't see my spiritual master. I took first and second initiation. I, did, I couldn't see my spiritual master until 76. 76, the Shiloh Prabhupada came in France. And uh, it was the third time the Shiloh Prabhupada was coming near to me and I uh, couldn't meet him. So that time I said I'm not going to miss him. I was a Pujari, the head Pujari. Our deities, Goranitai, had a very high standard. Nothing to envy to any Radha Krishna deities at that time. We had full offering, prasada, um, was very complicated um, um, worship. And we were two pujari, actually we were many of the two. But the temple priest decided two pujari would stay and everybody else would see we go to meet Srila Prabhupada in, uh, in France, in Novem Mayapur. Novem Mayapur, I think, it still exists. And it's in the center of, the, of France, and between Paris and Lyon, something like that. Valencay is called. And I, uh, the temple person said that you, me, you should stay uh, together with this other devotee. I protested. And I said, no, I want to go. And he said, no, you cannot go because you are the head pujari. And um, I said, okay, I'm a dead pujari, but I'm going. He said, no, no, you stay. At that time, it was very difficult to disobey to the temple prayer. It's not like today, everybody does what he likes. <laughs> <laughs> but at that time, you won't do that very easily. So I said, okay, okay, go. No, and everybody go. We, we were about 70, 80 brahmacharis at that time. We were all, and most all brahmacharis. I was a brahmacharya also. And I said, yes, go, go, go. As soon as they went, I called one of my friends, let's go to France. So we drove two days from Rome to France to meet Sila Prabhupada. When I arrived, Sila Prabhupada already arrived the day before. The temple, pres the temple commander was my very dear friend at the time, he's still my very dear friend. He said, oh, Manonat, you are here. I have a very nectarian service for you. Do you want it? I said, yeah, of course I want it. Are you sure? It's very, very nectarian ser service. He said, okay, what is this service? The only service left is to guard the Srila Prabhupada personal door, the apartment that he had. And I wondered how come the most nectarian service there is, nobody has already taken. In a way or in another, nobody was guarding Srila Prabhupada's apartment and I was appointed to be there. Although I didn't sleep and not eat for two days, you know, when you are 18, you can do anything. You can, you can lift the world with one hand, so much energy. So I stayed there, and uh, this apartment is a very peculiar door, actually it's a double door that opens like this. My service was to close the door when Everybody was going out and, um, and asked the devotees because Srila Prabhupada didn't like noise, especially slamming of the door. He really hated that. So I was for hours doing shh, shh to slow down. You know, we didn't have blood at the time. We, we had that liquid alava. So we were full of passion and energy, and the devotees were not working. They were along the long corridors of the castle. So we, um, and I decided to see my spiritual master. I couldn't, because this uh, very good devotees never forgot to close the doors. But at the end, his secretary, <coughs> who had uh, uh, prasadam plates in both his hands, he couldn't close the doors, so this was my chance to see Srila Prabhupada for the first time. I was first and second initiated. I was already, at the time, I was quite a senior devotee, you know. So I never seen Srila Prabhupada. So I, I thought, what do we do? Do I close the door or I enter into the room? I said, this is my chance, I enter the room. 
So nowadays, all these things may appear to many devotees very childish. And maybe they were. But we were living our relationship with Srila Prabhupada in a very deep and emotional way. Srila Prabhupada for us, at least for me, he wasn't a man. He wasn't even a guru, he was a deity. So that's the way I was perceiving Prabhupada. And uh, so I was very shy in entering his room because it's like when you enter into the deity room, you, are, you don't just enter, you know, you say your prayers, your mantra, you meditate on lotus feet, you ask permission, then you enter. So I entered and I saw Srila Prabhupada for the first time and um, he was sitting on the floor, very thin mat. Uh, he didn't have royal dresses like someone may imagine for a deity. He had a very simple cotton dhoti and, and kurta, and he was taking prasada. I was watching him, how he was taking prasada. The way he was moving, he hadn't seen him, so he didn't need to make up a show, you know, of moving in a certain way, of being very aristocratic in, in his face, and keeping his chin high, all these things you don't... Uh, if you are alone, you just, you know, relax and do whatever you want. But Srila Prabhupada wasn't that way because he was showing. Srila Prabhupada was that way. He was moving in that way. He was portraying his uh, face in that way. So he was cutting his chapati with his uh, three fingers like this. Then he take one piece, uh, put it in the sabji and do it like this without touching the lips. I saw Srila Prabhupada for a week, entire week, taking prasada every day. He never touched his face, his lips, not, not even one time. And he was like this, and uh, he was obviously enjoying his prasada. Then he saw me, and he asked me, oh, what can I do for you? And I couldn't answer. I just begged, doing obeisances and backed out because um, I think every, every one of Srila Prabhupada's disciples has a particular relationship with Srila Prabhupada. I never envied my god brothers and god sisters that would go inside and talk to Prabhupada and, you know, making, doing questions and uh, talking about plants like this, because I, I, I feel better uh, like a very young brahmachari at his lotus feet, and that's what I I like to be for the whole of my life. So now we have three or four little, very short pastime. First pastime is that uh, Srila Prabhupada was giving a Bhagavatam class. And uh, actually, since my time is running out, I should have cut on something. Anyway, one day Srila Prabhupada went out. He wanted to uh, sit down on the on the grass on, and, and and he asked the devotees are there any snakes and uh, uh, so in india you don't sit down everywhere especially at that time because there may be animals there may be snakes but in france there are no cobras you know there may be some snake it's not a big thing anyway there was one american devotee who misunderstood the prophet was asking and uh, he understood if there were any lakes so this devotee said, oh yeah, Prabhupada, there is a very big one just down there. You know? <laughs> and, and, and Prabhupada said, a very big one just down there. I said, yes, Prabhupada, a very big one. There is also a smaller one a little far. <laughs> and then all, everyone started to laugh very, like you are doing, but very bad, because we were about a 2,000 devotees uh, at, the, at, the temp, at that place at that time. And everyone was laughing and enjoying. And one devotee said to Prabhupada, no, Prabhupada, he misunderstood. And Prabhupada did this big oceanic smile that you just enjoy for a week just thinking to that. See, Prabhupada smiling was so beautiful, so exceptionally beautiful. Uh, another pastime, we were installing deities, and one devotee at the end of the installation asked Srila Prabhupada, how can we see the deities? How can we see Krishna? And Prabhupada chuckled a little bit. He said, we have been seeing the deities the whole day. You know? 
And uh, of course the devotee was meaning how can we see the deeds moving, but Bashila Prabhupada didn't make any difference between Shila, the deed is moving and the deed is not moving. For him, we were looking to the, to the deities. So he said to the devotees, you, you can see Krishna, we just installed it on the altar. And uh, another uh, short pastime is that uh, one, uh, one guest uh, did a question, made a question to the to Srila Prabhupada and asked him, he started the question in this way, Jagat Guru, he meant to follow the question with something else. So Srila Prabhupada stopped him and he said, uh, no Jagat Guru, I am Krishna Das, I am Krishna's servants, no Jagat Guru, like this. So everyone was thought, was worshipped him, rightly so, Srila Prabhupada said Jagat Guru, the Guru of everyone. But uh, Srila Prabhupada um, uh, taught us that uh, we can think in that way, but he never thought in that way. Uh, because the main quality of a guru is that uh, he thinks to be a servant. If a guru doesn't think to be a servant, he's not a guru. Because in the moment he's automatically fallen. So always remember this teaching from Srila Prabhupada. And he kind of scrammed, you know, like, like very strongly. No Jagad Guru, like that. No. And uh, so I want to be disciplined. I already stolen from my go brother, go sister, one minute, two minutes. So we stop here. I got four or five more pastimes, but I can tell them some other time. Ok, Hare Krishna, Shila Prabhupada, Kijai.